What's going on my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Today we are continuing on with our cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram series and we're going to be discussing ventricular fibrillation. So ventricular fibrillation is another one of our lethal rhythms. So in regards to the rate, you're not going to find a rate because of all of that fibrillation happening in the ventricles. The rhythm obviously will be irregular and P waves are not going to be apparent. Because P waves aren't apparent, the PR interval will also not be apparent, and the QRS intervals are just gonna be a whole bunch of fibrillation waves shown in the example next to me. The definition of ventricular fibrillation is multiple foci within the ventricles rapidly firing repeatedly, causing disorganized ventricular contraction. This is one of those three ECG patterns that we see in cardiac arrest. So when we're considering the causes of ventricular fibrillation, we have to consider our H's and our T's to determine what the underlying cause is so that we can treat it. So our H's consist of hypoxia, hypovolemia, hydrogen ions, meaning an increase in acidosis, hypo, hyperkalemia, hypothermia, and when it comes to our T's, we're looking at toxins, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, or thrombrosis from either pulmonary or coronary descent. Additional causes outside of our H's and T's can include sudden cardiac death, ventricular tachycardia that was left untreated, R on T phenomenon, heart disease, cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, and electric shock. So what interventions are we looking at with ventricular fibrillation? Well, if we find a patient with this rhythm, the first thing we want to do is call for help. We want to provide CPR and we're going to start following those ACLS guidelines. I recently recorded the new 2020 edition of how to pass your ACLS certification like a boss. I'll include a link up here in the corner. Make sure that you check it out. This will be very helpful for you in passing your ACLS and understanding this rhythm. In addition to CPR and following those ACLS guidelines, we're going to provide defibrillation, epinephrine, and antiarrhythmics such as amiodarone and lidocaine. Unfortunately, we're unable to do synchronized cardioversion because we don't have an organized rhythm. We're just having this fibrillation with our ventricular fibrillation. So we have to move on to defibrillation. So it is the first intervention for ventricular fibrillation as well as pulseless ventricular tachycardia. If these two rhythms are present, just like we do with our ACLS guidelines, we're gonna continue chest compressions without interruptions and get ready to provide a shock to our patient. So what does the defibrillation process look like? The first thing you wanna do with anything, AED or this, you wanna turn it on. With our biphasic defibrillators, we're gonna use manufactured guidelines, but with our monophasic, we wanna use 360 joules when we're providing shocks to our patients. We're going to place the adhesive pads on our patient like we've discussed before. We're going to place one pad over the right anterior chest wall as well as the second pad on the left mid-axillary position next to the heart. We're going to announce to the team that we are charging the defibrillator. We're going to press the charge button on the defibrillator. CPR can still take place during this process. When the defibrillator is fully charged, we want to verify with the team that everybody is clear before we provide a shock. So the team needs to announce all clear and you as the person need to verify that nobody is touching the bed and nobody is touching the patients because we don't want to provide a shock to someone who doesn't need it. Once everybody is clear, we are going to say all clear. We're going to press the shock button on the defibrillator and immediately after that shock, we are going to start providing CPR again immediately for at least five cycles before we reassess the rhythm. Looking at our epinephrine, it's a little bit different in regards to dosing that we discussed before with our symptomatic bradycardia patients. But this can be given one of two ways. It can be given for our idioventricular rhythms, or it can be provided for our cardiac arrests related to ventricular fibrillation, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, a systole and pulseless electrical activity. We can provide it IV or IL dose, one milligram, that's 10 mLs of one to 10,000 solution, administered every three to five minutes during resuscitation, followed by a 20 mL normal saline flush, 
and elevating the extremity for 10 to 20 seconds. We want to get that medication quickly to the heart. With our beta blocker or calcium channel blocker overdose patients, we have to give them higher doses for it to be effective. And that is usually 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. So considerations for epinephrine, the rising blood pressure and heart rate may cause myocardial ischemia and increased oxygen demand of the myocardium. High doses do not improve survival rates or neurological outcomes. And higher doses may be required if there are poison or drug-induced shock present with our patients. Let's talk about amiodarone. So amiodarone can cause toxicity. So it's really only used in patients with life-threatening arrhythmias and we need to administer it with sufficient monitoring. So we give this to our ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia patients that were unresponsive to cardioversion, CPR and vasopressor patients, as well as hemodynamically unstable ventricular tachycardias. Dosing for ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia cardiac arrest patients who are unresponsive to CPR, have shock present, and are on vasopressors, we want to give a maximum of no more than 2.2 grams IV over 24 hours. That means that our first dose is going to be 300 milligrams IV or IO push, and our second dose, if needed, will be 150 milligrams IV or IO push. Once you have provided that first dose and that second dose, amiodarone really is no longer a consideration. Considerations when it comes to amiodarone are a rapid infusion may actually cause a more hypotension, so that's why we need to sufficiently monitor these patients. Multiple dosings over that 2.2 grams in 24 hours may increase that hypotension to become more severe. So we really, really need to be careful when we're giving maximum doses. We also don't want to administer this medication with other medications that prolong QT intervals because this medication will also prolong those QT intervals. And lastly, the half-life for amiodarone lasts 40 days. It maintains in the system for the half-life at least 40 days. So that's why this medication becomes extremely toxic when given in higher doses. So when looking at lidocaine, lidocaine is considered immediately after the return of spontaneous circulation, such as ROSC with our ventricular fibrillation, pulses ventricular tachycardia, cardiac arrest patients, and is also an alternative to amiodarone in cardiac arrest for ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and our stable monomorphic ventricular tachycardias. So when we're looking at dosing for cardiac arrest, the initial dose will be between 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV or IO. Refractory ventricular fibrillation, um, additional doses can be given at 0.5 to 0.75 milligrams per kilogram IV push every 5 to 10 minutes with a maximum dosing of no more than 3 doses or a total of 3 milligrams per kilogram. If we have to give this as maintenance dosing, we're usually looking at one to four milligrams per minute or 30 to 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute. So other considerations when it comes to lidocaine that we want to consider is prophylactic use and acute myocardial infarction is contraindicated. We don't want to give this to these patients. Reduced dosing for the maintenance dose is considered when we have impaired liver function or left ventricular dysfunction as well as we want to discontinue, discontinue infusions if toxicity is present and there are signs and symptoms. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.